You are listening to The Mallory Report, a live radio show that ventures into the mysteries of life, as well as the hot topics of the day, either political or business. I want to welcome everybody this evening to the Mauer Report. I'm excited. I'm excited about my guest tonight because I got the feeling I'm going to learn probably more than I think I'm going to learn, which is a good thing. My guest tonight is Richard Easton, the author, the co-author of GPS Declassified from Smart from Smart Bombs to Smartphones, and that should be an easy enough title for me to say. But yet again, I find a way to get my tongue twisted all around. It. Richard, how are you doing tonight? Great, great to be on. So, Richard, take take what well, well, your your dad is the father of the modern GPS. But before we get into the the nitty gritty of that, tell me a little bit about your father, the man, before we start getting into what he did. Um, he had a very wry sense of humor. He was born in a small town in northeastern Vermont called Crassbury Common, probably best known for um, where Hitchcock filmed part of the movie of The Trouble with Harry with Shirley MacLaine. And uh, they wanted the beautiful fall foliage in Crossbury Common, and then a bad storm came, blew all the leaves down, and they had to film the rest of it on the set in California. But it's a, it's a very picturesque little town. Uh, my grandfather was the town doctor, uh, including stories about the pandemic of 1918. And uh, Dad joined the Naval Research Lab in 1943, uh, worked there until 1980, and got involved in the very early space program. Uh, he designed Vanguard 1, which is the oldest satellite still in orbit. And I was too young, I was two years old, but he used to tinker with it on our dining room table. And they've got pictures of the five kids in my family arranged around Vanguard One. So I've been within a few inches of the oldest piece of space junk out there. So, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, people, uh, when uh, we've had a lot of discussion, we just had the 60th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin, you know, the first man in space. Uh, but the previous first space race was to put up the first satellite and of course the Soviets were the first with Sputnik 1 and then Sputnik 2 and the White House made the announcement that uh, Vanguard Test Vehicle 3 would uh, put up the first American satellite and it got about four feet off the pad and blew up so so and the next day was December 7th so you know a lot of talk about uh, uh, space age Pearl Harbor but the little satellite, about three and a quarter inches long, I'm sorry, six and a quarter inches long, weighed about just over three pounds. That survived, and it was brought to my dad, who designed it. He designed all the test vehicles, the tiny little satellites. And um, his assistant, Marty Botoff, said, what should we do with it? And dad said, well, I guess bring it back. So put it in this little wood box, uh, bought a seat for it on a commercial flight back to Washington and carried it on board. It sat in our house, house overnight, and now you can see it in the National Air and Space Museum. So, you know, space was a very, uh, I mean, I had a lot of ways of a very normal childhood, but, you know, things like second grade show and tell, I brought the December 1957 National Geographic that had my father's picture in it. So, you know, space was a close presence in, in our lives. And we knew some of the figures who were important in the history of navigation, like Captain P.V.H. Weems, who taught Charles Lindbergh celestial navigation. So, you know, normal childhood, but yet with, with a few special things along the way. And um, in 2005, um, I was, by then I was aware of my dad's role in designing GPS. And uh, I started working on researching a book about it because I realized a lot of these people by then were in their 80s and maybe even 90s. And uh, there was a lot of knowledge about how GPS came to be that was 
not had not been written down and there are a lot of myths about gps which alas are still there seem impossible to kill an example of one is that uh, gps started out as a military only system and was opened up to civilians by the reagan administration after korean airliner 007 was shot down in 1983. well we have on our website a document from 1974 a GPS development plan that talks about a signal in the clear for both the civilian and the military user. And TI was selling the 4100 in 1981, two years prior to the Korean airliner being shot down. And probably the first users of GPS were civilian surveyors. You know, you only had four to six satellites, so you could just put your, your surveyor device down and wait for the satellites to go overhead. You know, with only four to six satellites, that's not enough to do worldwide navigation, but you can do surveying with that. So rather than uh, being military only, actually the first applications were civilians, but you know, that type of story, it seems like it's impossible to kill. So, uh, so, but, but, I knew a lot of the people that worked on it. I had a lot of the original documents. And in, in uh, 2006, Dad got the National Medal of Technology from President Bush, big ceremony at the White House. And uh, all the photographers were there to take pictures of George Lucas because his company <laughs> got also the National Medal of Technology. But at the banquet that night, uh, people I was sitting with were sicking me on, you know, go talk to George Lucas. You're never going to be in the same room with him again. So I went up to him and asked him, told him I was working on a book, asked him about first writing an article or a book, what he would recommend. And he said, oh, write a book. With an article, they'll edit the heck out of it, whereas with a book, you'll have editorial control. And I thought, well, if I'm George Lucas, publishers are going to be eager to publish what <laughs> I have to say. But I'm, I'm an obscure son of, you know, wh what do you have? And anyone who's written a book knows that in approaching a publisher, they're going to want to know what's your platform. You know, who follows you now? What articles have you written? And so I, I decided I had to... Uh, I had to go the other way, and I published my first article in May of 2006. That got a lot of attention, and um, I started giving talks about GPS, um, approached publishers and, and agents with very little success, but then my co-author approached me in 2010. We decided to unify forces and soon had a book contract and published it, GPS Declassified, in 2013. And I've had a lot of fun. I've spoken at the Explorers Club. I've been at Air Force Space Command, or now it's Space Force. But in Colorado Springs, we got to see where GPS is controlled. Uh, we got introduced in our talk by General John Hyten, who was then uh, head of Air Force Space Command. Now he's vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And, you know, so we've gotten some good publicity and recognition along the way. But I think the thing that most gratifies me is some of the people that worked on GPS, like uh, Pete Wilhelm, who designed all four timation for time navigation. That's what my dad's system was called before GPS. Pete designed all four Timation satellites. Um, he worked on the very first spy satellite, Grab, in 1960. And he said about our book, uh, where he knew the story, it was accurate. Where he didn't know it, he said he learned a hell of a lot. So, you know, very gratifying. Some of the people who built the very first atomic clocks uh, gave us high praise. So, so to have the professionals in the business like your book, uh, you know, that, that's, 
that's the best feeling you can have. Yeah, that's um, be- that, that's better. Actual, I don't want. Maybe I don't want to say that. Maybe it's. I mean, the people that know. I find this with my show, right? The people who do shows and know shows, I, I enjoy their praise ten times more than the average person. I don't want to say average person and be condescending about it, but you know what I'm saying. Oh, there's no average person, but yes, for the for the experts to say, "Gee, you got it right." Um, uh, that, that that's gratifying. And maybe I should explain what is GPS. Because, I was just thinking that maybe we need uh, to get a little bit more into what the nuts and bolts of the background of it. Yeah. Um, GPS has three segments. There's the satellites. There's the ground stations that update the satellites. And there's the receivers. So, um, so the satellites, one of the, the there were two major competitors uh, prior to GPS being formulated in 1973. One was my father's timation for time navigation. And he was talking with Dr. Arnold Shostak, who some people may know as son Seth. Seth Shostak has been working on SETI. But he was talking with Arnold in April 1964 about the hydrogen maser, which was a very precise atomic clock developed in 1960. And dad said, gee, that makes range measurement for navigation feasible, which means, all right, if you know where the satellite is when it sends out its signal, and you know what time it sent out its signal, and you know what time you received the signal, let's say it's a tenth of a second light travels 186,000 miles per second. So if you know it took a tenth of a second to go from the satellite to you, you're 18,600 miles from the satellite. And with four satellites in sight, you can solve for your three-dimensional position plus get the time synchronization in your receiver. And that's what my dad was talking about in April 1964. Uh, and that's how GPS works today. Um, so it's time difference. Now there, you know, there's elaborations like light is bent by the ionosphere. So you prefer to send it on two different frequencies so you can correct for that. I mean, there are lots of, you know, uh, clear elaborations that you can go into, but basically it's time difference equals distance difference. And part of the problem is, in 1964, the atomic clocks weren't very advanced. You know, they were too big, took too much power. You're putting them in outer space where they're subject to cosmic rays. You know, you need to harden them so that they don't get their time distorted. And um, and also, so, so my dad's system was for satellites in circular orbits, So adjusting for relativity is simplified if they're a constant distance above the Earth. He was thinking of either 27 satellites in eight-hour orbits. Remember, this is the late 60s. So they were worried that the ground stations could be attacked by the Soviets. So they had the requirement that the ground stations be either in the continental U.S. or secure U.S. territories. And that led to a problem gee, we don't have anything that fits that definition in the Indian Ocean. Uh, It's what they call the Indian Ocean Gap. You know, do you want to put a ground station in Diego Garcia? Does that make the system more vulnerable? So so the discussion of where to put the ground stations affected whether they put them in eight-hour orbits or 12-hour orbits. Now, 12-hour orbits, it's further above the Earth, so more people can see a satellite at a given time. So you don't need quite as many satellites to try to get four in view at all time. Um, but on the other hand, it took a little more money to, to get the satellites into 12 hour orbits, you know, a little more propulsion. Um, and my dad's system, again, either 24 or 27 satellites in circular orbits inclined about 55 degrees. So they they orbit up to 55 degrees north, 55 degrees south, completely symmetrical around the Earth. 
whereas the Air Force had their Project 621B, which had satellites in regional constellations, like they'd have a European constellation. They need to have the accurate clock in the in the satellite because the satellites are always in sight of their of their ground station. But that also means if you wipe out the ground station, you wipe out the system. And um, and there were problems. It wasn't truly a worldwide system. So so in 1973, they basically took my dad's system minus the signal, uh, which they took from the Air Force's system. But it's been a big fight over, ever since the system has been successful, you know, big fight between the advocates of Brad Parkinson, who was the first head of the GPS Joint Program Office, and my father. So, uh, and you can see some of the fight in terms of who got what award. But if you go through the history, it's pretty clear. You, you look at the um, articles from 1973 in Aviation Week, it's pretty clear that most of the system came from Timation. So, so again, you need accurate clocks, you need the ground stations, and another important thing is you need a miniaturized receivers. You know, today, uh, most people don't buy GPS. You know, they, they don't buy a Garmin. They, they've got their smartphone, and it comes for free. Um, my first GPS was, was a Garmin in 2007 that I remember going with my father to Old Home Day in Craftsbury Common, where in August they have a big celebration. And, and uh, you know, he always thought it was marvelous to use his own system. Uh, one thing the government did prior to 2000 is they degraded the signal for civilian uses. That was called selective availability, where they worried that terrorists could use GPS, you know, to, to attack say, uh, the White House. Um, but by now, there are enough other systems. The Russians have their GLONASS, the Europeans have their Galileo, and the Chinese have Beidou. So, you know, you degrade the American signal, that does nothing. They can use the other systems. And of course, like all good government programs, the Department of Defense was degrading the signal for civilian use uses, but airliners were using GPS, and they'd use land beacons where they knew where the beacon was, say near airports, to solve for selective availability. Gee, this land beacon says we're 100 feet off. You know, so it's like any good government program. The DOD is degrading it, and the Department of Transportation is telling you how to get around it. So, uh, when the Clinton administration took off selective availability in 2000, it was already obsolete by that point. So, so but, again, but again, it's uh, miniaturizing the receivers is critical. I mean, the original man packs, you know, were very cumbersome. And, um, you know, if you're in the Gulf War, you know, one of the things with the first Gulf War with Schwarzkopf's left hook was that it really surprised the Iraqis because they said, you know, we get lost in the desert. And yet, um, you know, the coalition forces went out because they could track where they were via GPS. And there was a bad sandstorm, uh, which you would think would be bad for the attacker. You know, the defender know where they are. But actually, the sandstorm gave coalition forces an advantage because due to GPS in 1991, they knew where they were, particularly in mobile action, much better than the Iraqis did. So that, that war uh, showed you know, how, how tremendously successful GPS would be, which prior to that, there was a lot of skepticism. You know, if you're in the, in the, Navy, you're interested in another cruiser, or if you're in the Air Force, which was running GPS, you know, gee, you're building the system that might be helpful in five or 10 years. Uh, what's it doing for me now? So, so they faced a lot of skepticism 
would uh, would GPS prove out? And uh, actually, the first Gulf War, they had selective availability turned on, but they had so few military receivers. They had about 900 of them, and a lot of the coalition forces, you know, would have their parents send them a Garmin or a TomTom. And uh, so the majority of the receivers used 5,000 versus 800 were civilian receivers. So we, 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 went, to, we went to war uh, on Garmin's and TomToms. That's incredible. So I've, I, you mentioned the, uh, the, um, the different places having their own network for this. Is, are we going to is yes. merging them or keeping them independent better for us long term? Um, the Chinese, they had a couple of missiles that, that failed in 1995, and they felt like they needed their own system. Uh, of course, you know GPS, uh, I think it's the Bond film Tomorrow Never Dies from 1997 where the Chinese spoof a GPS signal and, and lure uh, a British warship into Chinese waters. Um, he knew GPS had, had made it, you know, somewhat like uh, the original Bond films where they have a Gemini type uh, capsule uh, or rocket. Um, so given nationalistic fervor, I, they're not gonna unify the different systems. On the other hand, they have agreed on common signals like the L5 signal which both Galileo and GPS uses. So there's certainly need for cooperation so that the signals from the different systems don't interfere with each other. Uh, but, but I see the, the further developments as being um, things like improved inertial navigation or LoRaN. The GPS signal is pretty weak and there's a lot of fear about jamming or spoofing of it. And, you know, originally, like I said, there was a lot of skepticism. And now um, the problem is over-dependence on GPS. <laughs> so I, I don't think the different systems will unify. I think eventually we'll develop complementary systems, like the, the Europeans have LoRaN, and one of the stupid decisions was to decommission Loran C in 2009. Uh, we we uh, not only human action, but a bad solar storm, you know, the so-called Carrington event that in 1859 knocked out a lot of the telegraphs of the day. You know, so the GPS uh, of 1859. We've had a couple of cases where solar storms have come close to hitting the earth. Uh, the GPS satellites are shielded, but you know what would happen in a real bad storm? Um, you, you can try to model it, but there's, uh, there's nothing like seeing what actually happens. And I know now the military trains uh, for GPS denied environments. Uh, for a while, the, the Naval Academy stop teaching celestial navigation, but they've brought that back. So, uh, so again, the GPS, the problem isn't finding uh, uses for it, it's, it's over dependence. And when we published the book in 2013, the best estimate we had was that GPS was adding about $100 billion a year to the US economy. And that's for a system that I think inception to date has cost about 60 billion. So 100 billion added every year. Well, the current estimates are more like a billion dollars a day. So $365 billion a year added for a system which, again, inception to date has cost 60 billion. So it's one of the few government programs that truly pays for itself. But by the same token, if it was knocked out, you know, the costs would be significant. So, uh, so Congress has been mandating getting alternatives, uh, but, you know, we know how slowly our government works until something is badly broken. So this question comes from Germantown Runner, who is actually the guy who set this interview up, so we're gonna give him a 
a round of applause because I'm I'm grateful for him for doing that. Uh, what do you think of the Space Force? He's a great. He's, um, I think it's good in the sense that you know the the Army Air Force you know was split off by the Army post World War II because they felt like the the Air Force was not getting sufficient attention from the Army. And by the same token, there's been problems where where the Air Force has uh, probably not given sufficient weight to the to the space assets. So I think the concept is good. You know, it it it's just a matter of executing the change. And and. I know the Navy, um, McNamara in 1961 gave the Air Force priority in space. And I know the Navy was not happy with the way the Air Force was supporting them, you know, supporting the, the, uh, the, the fighter. Um, um, so it's, it's a question of how well, I mean, it's like, you know, ground control or, or ground support by, airplanes in World War II, you know, it was, a, it was a problem at times. The Air Force or the Army Air Corps had their strategic bombing uh, doctrine, and Eisenhower prior to D-Day insisted, I've got to have control of the heavy bombers. You know, they may bomb Germany and maybe wipe out its, its uh, infrastructure in two years, but in the meantime, I'm trying to land in Normandy successfully, and I've got to have these these assets um, available to to get this short term success. And and again, you know, you have various things you can use the space force for. For uh, you've got to protect our assets in space. Uh, you've you've got to find a flexible enough a way. I, I know one thing that that General Hyten was concerned about was that the when we went out to speak five years ago that that the Air Force people controlling GPS might not realize how critical it was. You know, like I said, a study from two years ago said it's adding three hundred sixty five billion dollars a year to the U.S. economy, and uh, a fair bit of that is. GPS is called a PNT system, positioning, navigation, and timing. Um, people don't realize how important GPS time is for civilian applications. Uh, you know, Wall Street uses GPS time for stock trades. Um, your uh, fiber optic cables, you're maximizing the use of the cable through using GPS time. Um, so, to get back to your the original question from about about the space force, I think it's a good concept. It's just a matter of making sure that it stays sufficiently integrated with the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. You know that the the grunt on the ground is getting getting um, communications, navigation, the the information that he or she needs to to do go about their duty and there's uh, there's always a temptation to um, to focus on the you know the flash Gordon aspect as opposed to the applications and and you know one of the innovations they did in World War II was that they'd have a ground controller who in many cases was an aviation guy, you know, embedded with the infantry to help direct the airplanes. Um, and, you know, one thing NASA found was that they always had one person who could talk with the astronauts who was also an astronaut. So, you know, getting people that speak their language to maximize the use of the Space Force uh, will, will show us long-term if it was a success. So I've got a specific question kind of off, and I'll follow up with a more broad question just because I'm curious. So, But they're so related, I have to ask them together. 
What effects do you think Elon Musk Satlink will have on the stability of the GPS system? And now I'm just going to widen it out to, are we going to put too much spa stuff stuff in space, quote unquote, space junk, space junk eventually to inter interfere with the system as well? There's been, um, when my, when my father was working on his system, there were actually, I mentioned the major competitor was the Air Force's Project 621B. But there was also, so my, my father's satellites in either eight or 12 hour orbits are called mid-earth orbits. The Air Force was close to geosynchronous, one satellite in geosynchronous, four satellites in each constellation in high inclined orbits. So geosynchronous is what, about 23,000 miles above the Earth. And then there was another proposal for low Earth orbit which the first NAVSAT transit were at about 600 miles, uh, well, 700 miles. So um, Johns Hopkins had a proposal for low Earth orbit set, uh, navigation systems. And it's possible that you could use uh, MUS system as, as a supplement to GPS. Now, your, the question is a good one. Could they interfere? I think, I think it's more of a problem for astronomy where, you know, the, the I don't know, what is must? He's got currently 800 satellites up there, something like that. I know some have been decommissioned, but, you know, he's talking about thousands and other, other systems similarly. I know he's putting up generally six, 60 in each each um, Falcon 9 launch. Um, so he's, he's talking about thousands. I think the satellites are small enough that it's not a major handicap for GPS. Uh, GPS, the, the greater problem is if you're in a, in a city with a lot of tall buildings. So the, the Japanese and the Indians have supplementary systems that worked with GPS and other GNSS global navigation satellite systems, like I said, the other three. Um, so they're at geosynchronous orbit near the longitude, say, of Tokyo. So they're there to supplement. If you're in Tokyo and the tall buildings are such that you only have maybe two GPS satellites in sight. You maybe get another two from from the Japanese regional constellation. So, so I think it's possible that that um, you know atomic clocks are so cheap by now uh, that that Musk you could use that as a supplement to GPS. And one of the um, uh, currently we're using 31 GPS satellites. And there's been discussion about uh, launching satellites that can be used for multiple use, have multiple uses, like navigation, communication. So if they knock out a, a GPS satellite, suddenly you can repurpose another satellite, put it in the, in the part of the constellation where the one that was knocked out was, and that way you get a more resilient uh, system that's, that's tougher to uh, to harm, but it, it's a good question. I I think it's possible that that Musk system may ultimately uh, find uses again as a supplement to GPS. So you, you we kind of referenced this earlier. I didn't even think about this with the GPS uh, and the the Wall Street trade. So what what other things out there use that kind of system that I'm not thinking about? If like we suddenly lost all of GPS, what kind of trouble would we be into besides me not be able to find my um, location where I'm at needing to go? Uh, precision farming. You know, you, you have a picture of your farm and you, you know exactly where your tractor is on the picture. So you may be optimizing your use of, fer of fertilizer um, you know, precision farming is, is, and, and of course it's heavily dependent on the crop season. You know, if you're, if you're, um, you know, it's a spring and, uh, and, uh, you're putting out the fertilizer, you know, you knock it out during that season. The, uh, 
the losses would be disproportionate. Uh, you have things like sensors for earthquakes. You know, how much is the ground moving? Um, you have um, Alzheimer's patients that have a GPS device. So if they, uh, you know, wander off, you can find them easily. Uh, or even pets. You know, you, you see every so often, gee, this beloved pet got, got lost, and yet you can put trackers on them. Um, there was something a few years ago where, where um, uh, a Christmas manger was being trashed, so they put a, they put a little tracker on the baby Jesus. <laughs> if somebody came back to, to, to trash the, the manger scene, they could follow where it was. Um, I was talking a few years ago to, uh, I went to, I'm a chess fan, and I went to the World Chess Championship in New York City in uh, 2016, and the guy I was talking to, his iPhone had been stolen. And he said, you know, they could track it. The next day it was in Europe being chopped up for spare parts or maybe ending up in Iran. So inventory uh, is, is a major, you know, following inventory. And of course, uh, I was talking about uh, jamming uh, in 2010, they were having problems at Newark Airport with G GPS devices there being jammed. And they figured out that it was a trucker who was being you know, monitored by his company. And he didn't like that. He wanted to take a long lunch. So he put you know, the jammer on the, uh, the uh, tracking device in his truck. So fleet management is an important uh for that matter you know now when you have a package being delivered you know they they can track very accurately where the package is and i think in most cases they would you know have a little gps device on it so um so there are all sorts of applications that in the 1960s and 70s they they could never dream of but but those those are some examples of it. For for the rest, you got to read my book. <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned that because I was just going to say we need to reset because we kind of talked about the book for a second and then we kind of dove off into this other stuff. Uh, tell people where they can find the book and find you and give give yourself a good minute, minute two minutes here about yourself and where people can find you and all that good stuff. Well, we have a website called gpsdeclassified.com where you can see some of our appearances and we have some primary source documents for any of the amateur historians out there that want to, you know, see, see, uh, see the 1974 development plan. Um, by now the book is mostly available through Amazon and we have an audio book, Kindle, hardcover and soft cover. So it's, it's basically available worldwide in any you know, application you want. Um, you can, again, uh, my, um, my co-author, Eric Frazier, was recently interviewed by National Public Radio about GPS. And we have, you know, in our recent news, we have our most recent appearances, I'm sure, uh, this this one will be up as soon as the podcast is available. So um, so GPS declassified, and if you search, you know Barnes and Noble or Amazon, it's uh, it's readily available. That's good. I'm just like so I'm glad to hear it's still out there and still. I mean, you obviously still have a pa I mean, obviously have a passion about. It, and you had a passion to get it from point A to point B too. Because you started, you said you started yep, kind of kicking and, the tires in 2006, and here you are, 15 years later. Yep, yep. Um, Bob Kern, who designed the first um, cesium atomic clock in orbit, which was put up in 1977, I spent a day plus with him, and we had lunch with my wife. And when I was at the restroom, he asked my wife, is Richard always obs as obsessed about a subject as he is about GPS? You know, so, so again, you got to kind of pass muster when the when the experts say, gee, how'd you know all that? that? That means you've done the research. And 
it's I, I mean I should tell a few stories if if we have time you have 20 um, minutes go ahead <laughs> okay um, Chester Klezak was one of the original supporters of GPS at Naval Air Systems Command and in the late 60s he was at the Pentagon and was being you know I want being interrogated what is this timation system and why should we fund it uh, one Navy guy said we already have 43 navigation systems what do we need another one for and Chester asked which one of the 43 could provide a Navy aviator his altitude above the South Pacific and actually there was a system inertial navigation but Chester knew that they didn't know about that uh, and the advantage of timation and GPS over inertial navigation was if if the uh, electronics went out in the airplane you you couldn't reset it in uh, in flight whereas with GPS you know you can just get the signal back so so GPS was facing a lot of competitors um, the original grant that Chester and his boss John Yobe gave for GPS well again the timation in 1964 was thirty five thousand dollars and the problem they had was to get something bigger, Yobe would have had to go up the line and Navair was also funding transit, the, pre, the first uh, NAVSAT system. So, so again, you had Pentagon in fighting that you, you had to, to try to negotiate your way around it. Uh, Chester said they took one of my father's engineers Matt Maloof, he had a convertible, and they put a receiver, I'm sorry, they put a transmitter in his convertible. He drove down 295 right past the Naval Research Lab in Washington, and they tracked it. They were getting the signal on one of the buildings at NRL, and Chester said that Maloof was surprised that they could tell when he was changing lanes. So, you know, they started out by testing it using vehicles and uh and then they launched their first satellite timation one in 1967 that worked very well timation two in 69 that transmitted on two different frequencies so i mentioned a while back the ionosphere distorts the signal but with two different frequencies you can correct for that and then the systems were unified in 73 and my dad launched the first rubidium atomic clocks in 74 and the first cesiums in 77. Um, another one of my dad's people, Jimmy Brisson, said using Timation 1, they had a, an NRL van parked by the road in Virginia. You know, so Naval Research Lab is in DC. We lived in Maryland, a couple miles away from, from the lab and you go across the Woodward Wilson Bridge and you're in Virginia. So uh, a Virginia cop stopped them and asked, you know, what are you folks doing with this NRL van? And Jimmy explained to them, well, we've, we've got our time synchronized with the satellite and we're uh, determining our position based on how long the signal takes to go from the satellite to the receiver in the van. And he said the uh, the cop looked more and more confused and finally said, well, good luck on your experiment and drove off. <laughs> so uh, uh, GPS was confusing people even before it got started. Um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting, you know, how do innovations occur? Um, and, and of course, for an innovation like GPS, you know, they're, People are going to worry, gee, are the people advocating it over-promising? Um, my father started working on the space program in 1952 called Project Viking, which was not to be confused with the later soft landing on Mars. Uh, it was using a single-stage rocket, Viking, to do upper atmospheric research. And the first launch he saw was not supposed to be a launch. They were doing a test firing, so they thought, a Viking 8 in 
June of 1952, and the contractor, Martin, changed the way it was bolted down. And there was so much vibration from the rocket that it took off during what was supposed to be a test firing. So it was a complete loss. And, you know, today we see uh, the Falcon Heavy, you know, the two side boosters land simultaneously, like happened three years ago. And, and it's easy to forget how, how difficult the rocket business was in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, you see the movie, The Right Stuff, and, you know, the atlases keep on blowing up. And people like John Glenn are thinking, gee, in a few months, I'm going to be on one of those suckers. I hope they, uh, I hope they get it right this time. So, uh, so the, the Elon Musk, where, you know, it's a big news if, if the Falcon 9 first stage doesn't land successfully. Well, 50, 60, 70 years ago, it was, uh, it was a much more chancy business. Yeah, I'm just, I'm back to being the cop for a minute. And, and trying to wrap my head around that. I mean, I'm still trying to wrap my head around all these satellites and times and bouncing it back and forth now. And I kind of, you know, have had a few years to think about it, let alone being in the moment back in the 60s and trying to process all that stuff when it really seems um, far-fetched. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the... Um, um, Pete Wellhelm, who I mentioned, designed all four Timation satellites and worked for NRL for 55 years. I, I still exchange emails with Pete when I'm writing a new article, I'll have him take a look at it and, you know, poke holes in it. But his comment was, gee, Roger, my dad, Roger Easton would have all these crazy ideas and I, I'd be trying to make them work. So, uh, um, the, you know, just to get, the amount of precision needed, you know, the accuracy for GPS for civilian use is probably a meter or two. I mean, I still get times I, I get upset when the, it's not the GPS device. Remember GPS doesn't track you. It's, it's your software that tracks you because this it's a passive system for military uses. The receivers, you know, in military use are not, emitting any signal. So, so, you know, the signal is going from the satellite. It has encoded when it, you know, it knows where the satellite was when it sent out the, the signal and it knows what time it sent it out. So it's sending that information to your receiver and your receiver uh, is processing that. And, you know, with four, four signals from four different satellites, it quickly solves for the three-dimensional position. But again, in 1973, electronics, you know, you, people often talk about the lunar module, you know, computer and how primitive it was to your cheapest smartphone today. So, so you know, the advance, advances in in electronics are also a major part of GPS's success. And I mentioned Chester Kleszak. In 1969, he was asked, how expensive will a Timation or a GPS receiver be? And he said, oh, probably about the cost of a color TV, which when I bought my first Garmin in 2007, it was about the cost of a color TV. So that, that's pretty pretty doggone good projection from Chester from the late sixties. And of course now it's free. Like I said, you know, you get a smartphone, it comes pre-installed, so you don't have to do anything. Um, so yeah, the, the advances are, are just mind boggling. And, and, and of course, uh, most people, um, they probably don't even know that GPS is a satellite based system. So it's it's become so much second nature that uh, uh, you know the things that people take for granted often tell you a lot about society. Just like I love looking at old magazines just to see what the commercials, what the ads are. You know that that's that's oftentimes more interesting than the articles in the you know old National Geographic. So. 
So I, I've got a, a Germantown Runner's actually got another question. I'm just going to ask it because I think it's phenomenal. What would your dad think about all the um, Mars expeditions currently going on the Red Planet pl and the helicopter that is uh, being flown around Mars remotely? Oh, we were on the space show in um, 2008, and it happened coincidentally. That was the day that SpaceX got their first Falcon 1 to go to orbit, you know, on their fourth try. And, you know, according to Elon Musk, if that had not worked, uh, Falcon, uh, I mean, um, SpaceX was going to be out of money. And he got the question uh, that day about, um, you know, the, the, the civilian app, the civilian rocket companies like SpaceX, are they going to be successful? And he said, yes, he, he thought that, that, uh, just as, you know, a fair bit of GPS was using civilian contractors. I mentioned Bob Kern, uh, Bob was not his former military guy, but he had his own company, Kernco, that, that built some of the best cesium atomic clocks uh, used in GPS satellites. Um, so GPS has always uh, depended heavily on civilian contractors, and you know now it's getting to the point where the government's just hiring SpaceX or ULA to, to launch the rockets. They don't have to do everything themselves. NASA doesn't need to design a, a, um, a Saturn V. They can get it from civilians. Uh, SpaceX, hopefully Blue Origin, uh, if Bezos can, can fix that company, or UOA. So, so he'd think it was marvelous. He, he foresaw some of it 13 years ago. And the Mars rovers, uh, yeah, the helicopter, I was, I was very happy uh, when, I, when I saw that was successful. And uh, it certainly opens up, um, you know, further eyes for future, uh, future rovers to, to have helicopters, you know, going overhead and, and precisely guiding you, just like GPS uh, guides you. Even if, you know, software sometimes drives me crazy when it wants me to take a left turn on a very heavily traveled road or it thinks I can easily go straight across, you know, what seems like a super highway. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy to go a slightly slower way that doesn't risk, risk life and limb. So, you know, the, the, um, the software is great, but it's, they still have problems. In fact, a um, ferry boat, the Pride of Canterbury, was GPS guided and it it uh, crashed into a World War I wreck, uh, a German ship. I think it was German submarine that was sunk. And it was on the uh, software for the GPS device they were using, but not at the magnification they were using. So, you know, GPS, uh, humans can do, still do very stupid things through software and uh, you, you still need your common sense. There was a story of a couple of high techies in New York City, and they were trying, they were on 30th Street, and they were trying to get to 12th Street. And they, you know, New York City, I mentioned the problem with high buildings. They, their GPS devices weren't working. Well, what do we do? Well, one of them said, well, let's see, we're on 30th. Uh, we looked that way, it's 29th. I think we head that way, you know, so this, there's always a need for common sense. And uh, if your GPS device is giving you a stupid answer, don't, <laughs> you, know, you know, use your common sense, please. Or don't turn into the lake. Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> I, uh, or onto, onto the train tracks. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. And, and like I said, there have been times where, no, I'm not turning left here. I'm going to turn right circle around and take an easier route that may take me a couple minutes longer, but I'm more likely to get there in one piece. So, so I've got a, a, a couple more quick questions. Well, like they have to be quick questions. We've got a few minutes left here. Um, are you a ham op, a ham radio operator? No, I am not. 
Well, that's going to disappoint some people in my chat room because they figured they figured you were. And um, the next one is: uh, Do you believe? I mean, the it seems the Pentagon's coming out and saying there might be the possibility of um, life other places with uh, extraterrestrials and UFOs. Do you have you seen anything, or do you believe anything else is out there? Um, it's quite possible. Uh, one of the people that my father was friends with, Phil Class, in the 1960s was, at that time, a, a debunker of UFOs. I mean, I've been following, you know, the latest developments with the Navy. And, you know, this question, is it UFOs? Is it some advanced American technology? I mean, you always, you know, you hear stories, gee, do they... Um, do they have follow-ons to the SR-71? You know, just like the uh, stealth fighter at one point was top secret. You know, are what they're seeing UFOs, are they more advanced American technology that they're experimenting with, or are they uh, aliens? Um, you know, the universe is a vast place. It's quite possible there's intelligent life down uh, out there though they may uh they may have the star trek beam me up scotty there's no intelligent life down here they may, they may they may say oh these humans are are so crazy we're we're going to keep our distance so um it, it's very intriguing um hopefully in the next year or two we're going to find out a lot more about what the pentagon knows I think we're the best reality TV show going as a planet. Just so, just to throw that out there yeah. in the universe. <laughs> well, you, 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 you know, it's like the, the joke that, uh, gee, the crazy people may have been sane after all, you know, <laughs> or, or the state, or you're thinking this, some, some about somebody else. And you're saying they're crazy. I'm crazy or we're both crazy. We can't both be sane. That's the only one of the four alternatives. But, um, you know, I was interested in UFOs. I was fairly skeptical in the 1960s. But but these recent developments, uh, uh, hopefully we'll know soon. You know, it, it seems like the, um, you know, the... Um, investigators are, are getting to the point where uh, the Pentagon may not know really what's going on, but, but it seems like the pressure to declassify things is strong enough that, uh, that we'll probably soon know everything that the Pentagon knows. Well, Richard, I appreciate your time this evening, man. This, like we, we were kind of joking before the show started, this hour is going to go way too fast. And I assure you it did. I hope you had a good time. Great time, and you're an excellent interviewer. Thank you, sir. And I'm sure we'll be in touch to set up something. I've still got more questions, so we'll be we'll be back in touch to talk some more. So sounds great. And thanks, thanks to uh, uh, the German people who runner. set this up. German Town Runner, he's yes. amazing. He'll be talking to you yep. on Gab. He appreciates me saying that. So <laughs> have a good night. Oh, great. Thank you. And a. And before I run out of time, uh, yesterday was the 10-year anniversary of the show, so I kind of spent some deep time reflecting on all that. So uh, you'll notice some changes over at Mallard.com. They're not all done yet. I'm just kind of tweaking things up. you got your subscribe options. You've got your newsletter, which I am going to be working on immensely in the next few months. That's my project for the summer, to get that going. So if you're not on the newsletter list, you need to be, because that's where the place to be is going to be. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Mail Report. Stay tuned for details on saving money at the Duck Pond Shop. I hope you enjoyed this report. Please subscribe so that you can join us again. And if you appreciate the show, leave us some stars or a review. For more notes from this show or other great shows, check out Mallard.com. A reminder, the views and opinions of the show are those of the host and guest and do not represent any sponsors, affiliates, or any other partners of The Mallard Report. Now for your money-saving tip. Promo code Mallard at checkout of duckpondshop.com where you can get your t-shirt, coffee mug, and other great products. That's promo code Mallard at checkout, duckpondshop.com. Until next week, stay safe and keep whacking.